things in our what? Biosphere. In our biosphere, this planet. We have something called the terrestrial ecosystem. That's where we're walking on some sort of ground. Uh, forests, grasslands, deserts, tundra, all very different from each other. And we're going to find different groups of organisms that utilize different resources in each. Marine ecosystem, marine ecosystem so we're talking about ocean. Um, and that basically has to do with depth of ocean. Intertidal, naritic, oceanic, and benthic. And then freshwater, lake. Yes? Yeah, because some fresh water leads into salt water, right? It's called brackish water. So you also can see brackish water in intertidal zones where, where rivers, for example, feed into the ocean. Yeah, because of the two coming together, it mixes up a lot of the stuff that's on the ground. You'll see this in the, in the, you know, when we get thaw of ice in the spring. Water is heaviest at four degrees Celsius. It's not heaviest at zero. Did you know that? So when the, when the ice starts to thaw, it sinks to the bottom and stirs up the bottom of lakes. That's why in the springtime, you get, your lakes look like bleh until all the ice is gone and all the silt settles down again. That's actually very good for the lake for that to happen because it stirs up the bottom. Just like, you know, when you make compost, it's better for the compost to do what to it? Yeah, stir it up, get some oxygen in there. Exactly. So that's better for the, um, the organisms that live in the compost. So this is a map of some of the different zones and the places in which they are on this wonderful planet of ours. We can see that in all the continents, for the most part, we have a variety of different ecosystems. So just because we have a continent over here all by itself, what's this? That's Australia. We see that Australia has a quite a, a, quite a varied number of ecosystems within that piece of land. Yeah, exactly. A lot of it has to do with what? Elevation. Yeah, elevation away from sea level. So terrestrial ecosystems, biomes, geographic land areas with unique plants and animals. Forests, we've got a lot of those in Maine, yes? From proper rainfall and temperature, there's different types of forests. Not only rainfall, but temperature is a key. So what are we going through now? My favorite season, cold. So the plants and the organisms have to be able to sustain varying temperatures, winters versus summers. So the types of forests we're going to see are going to be different because one of the key things is temperature. Deciduous, what's a deciduous forest? That's what we have. Yeah, so what happens? We have a mix of conifers and hardwood, so. So what happens to the hardwood, guys? How come? Why? Exactly. Can't get as much water, doesn't have as much sunlight, can't produce as much what? Energy, in turn, will. Yeah, exactly can't produce as much glucose, which would then break down to produce energy. It takes a lot of energy for a deciduous tree to keep its leaves. It takes a lot of energy to keep those leaves going. Even though that's where the energy is produced, it takes quite a bit to maintain them. So deciduous forests we usually see in places that have varying cool and warm temperatures. In the warm seasons, we're going to see those leaves pop out, lots of photosynthesis synthesis happening, lots of growth in the, in the plant or tree. And then when it gets cold, we want to conserve energy, get rid of those leaves that take a lot of energy to maintain. We also in this area have animals that will do that too. What do they do in the winter to conserve energy? They hibernate. A, because there's not as much of their food source available to them. 
and B, to conserve energy. What's a conifer or coniferous forest? Yeah, so we have, we have kind of a combination, don't we? We see both in our forests. So we see those evergreen trees. What's evergreen mean? Yeah, they don't lose their leaves like the ones with the big, flat, open surface leaves like this. What does a evergreen typically have? Yeah, thin. Yeah, with some kind of waxy coating that's going to help conserve energy. It doesn't take as much energy for pine needles to be maintained versus leaves. Tropical. That's where I wish I was right now. Yeah, we're going to see very different plants. In hotter, warmer regions, they can also be very wet regions. And many, many different species live there, especially ones that are temperature sensitive because they're not going to get as much fluctuation in temperature like we do here in Maine. Grasslands. They are big open areas between forests and deserts, also called plains, steeps, savannas, or prairies. Do we have any of those here in Maine? Yeah, yeah. big, huge fields, right? We could consider them grasslands, right? Between forests. Until what? And still somebody plants. Well, or a lot of our grasslands came from what? I'll just say plant potatoes. When somebody did what? Yeah. Somebody came in and cleared away a lot of the trees, grasslands. The first kind of first progression of filling in. What, the grasslands? But I disagree. <laughs> but anyways, anyways, deserts, extremely hot regions. So we're not going to see a lot of plant life there, are we? Why? Why? Why do we have such a fluctuation in temperature in the desert? Yeah, the plant life has a lot to do with helping to maintain temperatures for us. Right, but it also helps to absorb that energy too, bring up some of that excess heat. So what happens in the desert when the only heat source is not being fluctuated by a whole bunch of plants or grasses, what's the heat source in the desert? The sun. So when the sun goes down, whew, it gets cold in the desert, right? Tundras, far north, high mountain tops. We have Arctic, Arctic tundras, where permafrost. Per I even had coffee today, and it's still not working. Permafrost is seen. What's permafrost? Yeah, ground that never thaws. Exactly. Yeah, or Antarctica, places like that. Alpine tundras, and that's more kind of what we see here. Mountain tops, tree lines, uh, or above tree lines tend to have more snow. So Mount Washington, for example, can be considered an alpine tundra. Um, why do the trees start getting shorter and shorter as we get higher and higher on a mountain? The air gets thinner. The air gets thinner. The, the, and when you take anatomy and physiology, you'll understand. But in order to take oxygen in, gas exchange, there has to be what we call a pressure gradient. So high pressure versus low pressure. Molecules want to move from a high pressure to a low pressure. And at sea level, we have a nice pressure gradient that organisms have the ability to set up. 
You do it when you breathe in and out. You set up a pressure gradient inside your thoracic cavity. When you breathe in, you make, think of it as a container. That container in your chest, larger. What happens to the pressure inside that larger container? No. It actually goes down. Um, picture. So if I have a beaker full of molecules, right? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Which beaker has higher pressure? This one has lower pressure. This one has higher pressure. Yes? So the smaller container has a higher pressure. If molecules in my atmosphere want to go from a high pressure to a low pressure, what do I do to attract them there? I make the container bigger. So when I widen, when you breathe in, what do you do to your chest cavity? You make it big. The air from the atmosphere at a higher pressure wants to go into that container because it's at a what? It's at a lower pressure. When you breathe out, what do you do to your, what do you do to your container? You make it small. Now the pressure inside the container is higher than the pressure out here where the molecules want to go. Out. So that pressure difference in the organisms is harder to, harder to achieve when we go further away from sea level because the molecules that are moving around in the atmosphere are moving around at a much lower pressure. So you breathing on the top of a mountain, if you go there really fast, it's harder to do, right? Because it's harder to do this, set up that pressure difference. So organisms tend not to grow as very tall when we're talking about plants. And then as we get way, way up, we don't even see those big, big, huge ones anymore. We see the little dinky short ones because it takes more for a larger organism to create that pressure difference. So when they say the air is thinner, there's still oxygen and stuff up there, but it's at a lower what? It's at a lower pressure. And it's harder for you as an organism to have gas exchange happen. Okay? Where the heck were we? Okay, so top of the mountain, alpine tundra. So Mount Washington's a good example of that, right? Marine ecosystems, and there's a nice cute little picture on page 382 in your textbook. Marine ecosystems are salt water ocean. Now the intertidal zone is where the oceans are going to meet the land. And we see a lot more organisms there in the intertidal zone because there's a lot more what? Yeah, sun exposure. Sun can penetrate down into those intertidal zones. The neritic zone is that little continental slope as we start to go down, down deep into the ocean. The oceanic zone is deep water, and the benthic zone is really deep water. For many years, we thought nothing lived down there, right? Because what happens when we do the opposite? So we went to the top of the mountain and we had trouble with exchange, right? What happens when we go down? The pressure's going to go way, way up in the atmosphere. And where are molecules going to want to go? From a high pressure to a... Do you ever, do you ever dive, go diving? Or ever hear of something called the bends? One of the molecules we can't exchange from our atmosphere, even though there's lots of it, is nitrogen. Because we can't set up a proper pressure gradient to do that. What happens when we go down? Nitrogen, so you can have a exchange of nitrogen. So nitrogen will go from the, the tank that you're breathing into your blood, which it normally wouldn't do. So what you have to do when you go diving is very slowly come up to equalize that pressure. So what can happen to the nitrogen that's dissolved into your circuit? It can leave very slowly. What happens if you come up real quick? You get the bends. What's the bends? That bubbling. All that nitrogen is going to come out of in your circulatory system. Not good. Very painful. Could it kill you? Yeah. Absolutely. 
So yeah, that's what that chamber does. It brings the pressure way, way high. So we get that, keep that nitrogen in and you slow, exactly. So we don't basically bubble nitrogen in our circulatory systems. Not fun, no. So freshwater ecosystems, and we live in a beautiful state that has many, many, many freshwater ecosystems. Anybody live near a lake? I love my lake. Take care of your lake, okay. The duck people? Why? Yeah, they want the lake high so they can hunt duck. But that doesn't coincide with when algae is at the top of the lake. So by the time they get done hunting, the algae has sunk to the bottom of the lake. So after they get done hunting, they drain the lake. But uh, down, it's too late. All the algae is at the bottom, so it's not leaving the lake. So the next year, when they fill it back up, they fill it back up with the existing algae, plus all the But is that now? Now here's a here's here's another question for you. It, it's not necessarily because of the height. What do I want to say? It's not necessarily because the lake is too full. It's what's going into the lake that's allowing that algae to overproduce. Kill it off. As soon as the algae was gone, they dig the lake back up. Now, what could you do to, to help alleviate that problem? Get rid of the duck <laughs> no. No. Right, the duck hunters aren't going away, but so what can you do? Right. So it's already started out. And that, it, right there, bing, 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 is the biggest problem because what did the farmers do to the land to farm the land? Exactly, and what does that algae love? Yeehaw! So if you live near a lake, freshwater ecosystem, one of the things you have to remember is that you have to equalize that. Yeah. When you start dumping things like uh, phosphorus, for example, into the lake from your soaps in your wash, and a lot of the houses around lakes would dump in gray water, right? How many? Yep. Yeah. Algae loves that stuff. Exactly. So that feeds some of those organisms, which then grow way out of control and choke off a lot of the other organisms in that ecosystem. So we have, again, um, oh, where do we see this? This is on page, freshwater is on page 380 in your textbook. So wetland, shallow places, where my husband loves to go fishing for his bass, marshes and swamps and floodplains, the littoral zone, shallow, next to the land, lots of sunlight, lots of small organisms, lots of plant life. Then we have the open water zones, deeper, where sun can penetrate. And then we have deep water zones where, just like the ocean, sun can only go so far. To Lake Tahoe? I've been to, I've been to, yes. Never been in the lake, but. Oh. It's a beautiful place. California. It's right on the. It's beautiful, and that's why you can see it at the bottom, because there's nothing, nothing disrupting your view. All right, resources are the materials that meet the basic needs of living organisms. So again, in each of these ecosystems, we have to be able to feed everybody that lives there. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about resources. There are non-renewable resources that are very limited, and then there are renewable resources. And usually renewable resources have something to do with what? Heat. No, think. Production. Yeah, or 
yeah, organisms reproducing, food sources reproducing, plants reproducing that others happen to eat. Give me an example of a non-renewable resource. Fossil fuels. Or what if, what if, well, that's not really a fossil fuel, huh? Yeah, porous rocks, rock formations. Those are examples of non-renewable source resources. Pollution. Big problem, right? Release of byproducts from resource utilization or resource overutilization. When we give too much to certain organisms, just like our algae in the lakes, what are they going to do? They're going to grow like crazy. What are you laughing at? Oh, you. So, pollution, not necessarily, you know, something we think of like waste, but pollution can also be too many resources causing an overgrowth of different organisms in an environment. It's going to alter the environment in an undesirable way, which might be, again, back in the lake, too much algae is going to kill off what in that ecosystem? Yeah, it takes up a lot of oxygen, blocks some of the sunlight, and kills off some of the organisms like what? Fish. Yeah, like fish. <coughs> yeah, it depends. The different fish have different, um, different, what do I want to say? Yeah, that's a good way. Or can, exactly, they can get away with less uh, oxygen. Oh, yeah, I've seen them up close and personal. Erosion, wearing down the land by wind and water. What's one of the things that increases erosion rate around some of these bodies of water? Yeah, by taking away what? Yeah, taking away trees or root systems of plants that are normally there. When you take away those big root systems of all those plants and grasses or whatever it is you clear away, what's going to happen when it rains? Yeah, it's going to wash that land right away. So erosion is going to increase when we decrease the plant life that holds it in place. Decertification, what's that? Well, the soil, yeah, the soil starts to become so fine because so many of the organic materials are gone from it that it goes to sand. Anybody ever um, go to the desert of Maine? Love that place. Oh, you're going to go. Go in the summertime, though, so you can take your shoes off and walk around in the sand. Where is it? It's in uh, Freeport. Freeport? Right outside of Freeport. But what happened there is um, there was tons and tons of farming going on in the area constantly clearing land, clearing land, clearing land. And that nice organic soil was slowly, slowly eroded away. And what was left behind? The sand. Wait, the desert of Maine was made by farmers? Correct. I thought it was a Over farming. Well, over farming led to the big dump of sand underneath. So when we over farmed the organic material on top, we exposed what? the sand underneath. Um, Why didn't they put the dispersed like they do now? The, the land around my house has been farmed for 100 years or more. They, well, you just didn't happen to have a big whole pile of sand that got dumped off by some glacier underneath your house. Oh, so it's not a very thin layer of... So you might have a lot more organic material before you hit the sand layer. Deforestation, removal of trees, removal of those big roots, that's an issue. Because that can increase erosion rate. So, resources and pollution with respect to land. Where have we severely eroded things? Look at the, look at the coastline, okay? How are we up here in our good old state of Maine? Yeah, but look at, look at with respect to erosion. How come? It's, it's a lot of rock. But what else haven't we done in this state? 
pulled all the trees out and developed that coastline as much as, where are we going here? It's hard to see. Where's that? No, this is Maine. This is Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, right? As we go underneath Rhode Island, we still got some, but then where do we hit it up again? New Jersey, New York. Yeah, uh -huh. because what have we done? Yeah, industrial, well, cleared away all those trees, cleared all that land so we could put up, you know, the Jersey Shore. The Jersey Shore is not going to be there much longer because it's going to be where? It's going to be in the ocean because erosion rates are, are increasing at a very rapid rate. Yeah, but that's different. The trees had to grow, so they had all that time to grow as much as they felt like they grow. There was no tree. And what happened? And then when we came, we actually wiped all those trees out. The yeah, but, trees but what happened, happened during the Ice Age to, to our land the way we know it? it yeah, switched it, it switched around because of that. I wonder, I wonder how old the old Hmm? Washington State's considered temporary. Mm-hmm. Parts of it. So, do you know what the oldest tree in the state is? I don't. What the oldest growth is? I'll bet it ain't more than 100, 100 No, no, no it's no definitely old, more than that. There's no old growth in the anymore. No oh, we have some. We still have some. I Big, we have, we had a lot of clearing for farming. When you look at a forest, yeah, but look at, because, because of the paper mills, but, correct. When you look at a forest, it, you, it, typically in the New England region, we had what we call oak chestnut, older growth, longer living trees. And what happened when we started to clear away for the paper mills and for the farming and all of that stuff, we killed off a lot of those older growth forests. So now what we see is more of those conifers, the pine forests. So we see more fast growing pines. We see maples, we see oaks, we see beech, stuff like that. But as far as um, chestnut trees, elm trees, a lot of those got killed off by what? Yeah, certain diseases that overtook them. <laughs> They're gone. We still have one hanging out in the field. We're nice to it. But yeah, so you'll see the, the type of forest change through the years. So 10,000 years ago versus today, we see light versus dark going on. Tropical forests down in here, 10,000 years ago versus today. So we start to see the land change. Desert, decertification risks and decertification. And again, typically in places near a coast, near a place where we have a lot of what going on? Erosion, erosion because of what? Population. Yeah, or erosion because of some, some business type transaction that's going on there. What do we have a lot of going on in here? We have a lot of storms, but shipping. A lot of shipping going on in these areas. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of clearing, changing the land so cruise ships can get in and out, and that caused the decertification of the land. Into Portland, but yeah, see, so you typically see that happening because of the the climates, and because of of what we've done to those areas as well. We play a big role in that, um, changing, changing the land. There's humans. So humans alter the distribution of water in environments with things like dams and aquifers, changing levels in lakes to suit our fancies. Dams have several negative impacts on an ecosystem. Natural course of rivers is disrupted, and that damages estuaries, those, those places between, exactly, between the flow of a river into an ocean. 
Water's lost by evaporation and seepage because sometimes exposing more water, tumbling more water over a dam is going to cause excess what? Well, evaporation rate is going to increase. So if you tumble the water, move it around very fast, the evaporation rate is going to go up. So we're going to lose more to the atmosphere than we normally would if the dam wasn't there. Well, maybe not here, maybe somewhere else. But what's going to happen somewhere else? They're going to get more what? More water. See what? See what? Everything builds on itself. Salt in agricultural runoff can affect the water and the organisms that live in the water. The concentration of dissolved substances in the water. Well, and another thing, um, you know, our discussion of tonicity way back when, we talked about isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic solutions. When we add things to the environment like that, that eventually run off into our water, that's going to affect cellular metabolism. Sediment is going to reduce the effectiveness of dams as it builds up on the other side. So we constantly have to do what if we want to keep it going? Yeah, we dredge it, we pull it out, and we change the ecosystem. So water redistribution and or removal can have other consequences for the environment. Um, groundwater that normally is produced can slowly, slowly subside. Yeah, and all the Exactly. Yeah, they're changing again because so many more people are moving into the areas, they're clearing different areas, they're pulling away normal resources that would fill those, that groundwater. We're going to end up with so big holes. Global warming is going to have a benefit because it's going to raise the sea levels, which is going to raise the water levels. Well, I don't know if you call living underwater a benefit, but I mean, if you want to, <laughs> you can. Yeah, we don't need Florida. As long as they keep Disney World, we're good. Um, groundwater removal also is a cause. Uh, salt water intrusion can come into some of those freshwater areas. So water conservation is increasingly important as the availability of potable water supplies decrease. What's potable water? Yeah, something you can put in a pot and use to eat. So wells, it's things that we use. No, that's true. But things we use to survive. Fresh water. So, modern agricultural techniques have had several negative effects. Clearing the land, taking out those roots, erosion, messing with the groundwater. When we put chemicals in the land that then seep down into the groundwater that normally we would use to drink. Monoculture has increased the susceptibility of crops to disease and insect damage. What the heck does that mean? Monoculture. Using the same seed or whatever? No, just having the same plant. So if I had any given plot of land before I came in and altered it, I might see a variety of stuff. Bushes, grasses, ferns and moss, right? Isn't that beautiful? Thank you. But then we come in and do what? We take this land and we wipe out the diversity in it and we plant a whole bunch of the same thing. Now, when we plant a whole bunch of the same thing, we might have an organism that enjoys whatever that is, right? That can then do what? have one hell of a time for itself because now look at all the goodies it's got. So insects, diseases, damage like Dutch elm disease for example, because everybody kind of liked those elm trees so they left them there but they got rid of all the other stuff around them. What happened to the trees? They were there first but because we eliminated... 
Right, but if, exactly, and if we eliminate the what, we eliminate the diversity in an area, then we actually give a benefit to those diseases and those insects. It was brought, I think it was brought in by, it's one of those invasive species kind of things. It was brought from somewhere else. Yeah, or an animal. I don't know exactly. That's a good thing. We should Google that up. Hmm. Depositing it from somewhere else. And that's why it's very important when you go to other countries or different areas, one of the things in customs they do is not let you do what? Don't bring any plants or food or fruit because there could be organisms in there. Like, you know, you go to the store and you buy bananas, right? And then, you know, when it's warm in your house, you have a whole bunch of fruit flies. Well, guess where they came from? Your bananas. Chilean fruit flies. So what if it was something else? Like an organism that liked elm trees. Yeah, or, or fungus or different other, other pests that can harm plants. So use of fertilizers and pesticides has done a number on the environment. Pesticides because if I have one nasty little pest that likes this monoculture that I've created and I throw chemicals all over it to kill them, I'm not necessarily just killing them. Yeah, I might be killing somebody else in this little, a little plot of land that I really don't want to kill. And then the chemicals themselves are going to do what? They go into the ground. They can get into groundwater. So fertilizers and pesticides, very bad. Over irrigation, again, wearing away a lot of that land that we've pulled those roots out of that doesn't get held anymore washing it downstream or washing it away is a big problem as well. Energy consumption during agriculture has drawn from finite fossil fuel supplies. Do we have like an infinite supply of fossil <laughs> Yeah, no we don't. Uh, agriculture has also contributed to a lot of soil loss because of the, all the things we've been talking about. Pull out the roots, wash away the land. Other effects to enhance the human food supply have had mixed results. What's the best, I mean, and this is what we're, we're trying to come back to. We're trying to come back to what? Yeah, back to the way it was, the smaller farms, the diverse farms. Well, they're not trying to. We're, we're, they're coming to the forefront. We're working on it. So the green revolution, excuse me, and genetic engineering have produced high productivity plants that often require high inputs of water and nutrients. Yeah. So not necessarily um, beneficial to the ecosystems in which they're in. <clears throat> Livestock production has provided proteins for human diet but also has been energy in intensive and a source of pollution. So when we create these fish farms, for example, lots of energy comes from the ecosystems in the area and can also be a big source of pollution because of the way that they are run. Yeah. Uh, just the yeah. yeah. Why? Yep. Yeah, because we fished them so much, what's happening to the population? And and if now and if I go if I go talk to a, a shrimp fisherman, they're gonna hate the fact that that was done. But if it's not if they, if we didn't do it, what would happen? We would run out of shrimp. We'd run we exactly. Yeah, but again, you're gonna and then what what? Trash the environment. Exactly. That's where I was going. So what? There's too many people. No, we're just not treating it very well. So fishing has also provided protein, but is depleting populations of some fish. OK, and we have to learn that we can't have. Caught, it's a good example. 
Yeah. So, in the northern Atlantic cod fisheries, estimates of cod stocks were too high. Practice of discarding young cod, not of legal size at sea, caused a higher mortality rate than was predicted. And what happened? The fishery collapsed in 1992 and has yet to recover. So if we look at the thousands of metric tons of fish in 1970s versus 2000. Yeah. Holy crap is right. We did the same thing with buffalo in this area, right? Big, huge, majestic animals that roamed. And what did we do? Wiped them all out. We did the same thing with turkeys. You know, except we, we protected them and they're coming back. Yep. So, and we encroach on their land and then we kill them off because they are bothering us. Hmm. Uh, yeah. well, well, the, see, there seems to be a common theme here all the way through this. Correct. The problem, the problem is the same every single time. Yes, uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, All right, so <laughs> resources and pollution energy, the energy discussion. Now, we need a lot of energy to run all of the wonderful things that we've created as humans all the beautiful buildings, all the wonderful cars, all the lovely fun that we've created for us as humans. So we need to make more energy to power those things. Nuclear power provides about 6% of the world's energy. Can be dangerous, produces radioactive wastes that are going to end up hanging out for thousands not just a few, thousands of years. Most of the world's energy is 75% of the world's energy is provided by a non-renewable fossil fuel source. Problem number two. So what do we do the math? 75 and 6, what's that? 81% of the energy that we produce as humans ain't so good. Burning of fossil fuels also introduces what into the environment? Pollutants. Pollutants. The problem is there's too much, energy, there's too much money in fossil fuels for it to No. The problem is exactly what you said. There's no incentive for people to stop doing that because it's not encouraged. There's too much money involved in, the, in getting fossil fuels and selling fossil fuels for people to say... You watch one day from politics, you switch over to solar power, which is, it has to happen soon. It has to. We'll be charged for something. <laughs> I'm serious. What's going to happen? Don't be surprised. <laughs> Oh, oh, because they have to process it. It's already happened. Rainwater. They're getting charged by square footage of your house roof and your driveway. The rain runoff, you're getting charged for it. A rain tax. So, carbon dioxide, byproduct of fossil fuel production, produces excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is kind of like an umbrella that holds in what? All the heat that normally would dissipate. So we call this a greenhouse gas because have you ever been inside a greenhouse? It's hot in there. How come? Because that's what it was designed to do, hold in a lot of the heat that the plants give off so that it can keep the plants warm and survive. Well, when we do it to our atmosphere, not such a good idea. So greenhouse gases cause climate change. They cause an increased temperature in our what? In our biosphere. What's going to happen when the temperature increases? 
Yeah, a lot of that permanent ice isn't so permanent anymore, and it's going to start to melt. When it melts, what happens? What happens to the ocean? It gets higher. The melting ice caps will cause sea levels to rise. And then, that isn't the salt. The salt will not damage the ocean. It's the too. Correct. So it changes a lot of things. It changes that stability and salt concentration. It messes with the tonicity of the organisms that live there, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's right. So the mean global temperature change. If we look at history, we see a fluctuation, yes? Yep. Yeah. Well, that, you know. Well, we don't really have you know, exact. exact records, right? So, not, it's not so we see graph. a fluctuation. What happens here? Going yeah. There is a Minimal likely increase, most probable temperature increase, maximum likely increase. So we're somewhere in here in reality. Hmm? But, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> We've seen a lot of change just in my lifetime. I remember when I was a kid. We had snow up our waists. There was so much snow. <laughs> our last storm, was that a typical snowstorm? No, because it was mixed with what? More rain than usual. Why? Because the temperature was? Just saying. So this is, this, is, this is what I want you to do when you decide to do something. And that's what I want you to do. And that's what I want you to do. Us guys, we can do it too. That's what I want you to do. And that's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to do. Us old guys, we can jump on the bandwagon. All right? This is what we need to think about. Yes? So we need to, we have the technology. We need to convince the powers that be to invest in the technology. Yeah, but don't say that because you're going to be the voice of the future. So you have to be that pain in the keister that keeps saying, this is the way to go. That's right. You be that change. Kids. All right, so, okay, no politics in biology class. So these are some of the renewable resources, some of the things that we have technology for that we really have to start investing in. Wind power. Now, why do you hear about wind power? It's super easy. <laughs> well, it's, it's going to be expensive in the beginning, and this is the problem. A lot of these technologies are going to be expensive in the beginning because they're new. Remember the first CD player? Oh my, god. oh my god. Now you can go to the store and you know you pay five bucks for a CD player, right? So is it going to be expensive to develop? Yes, it is. What's a CD player? I don't think it is. If it's expensive to develop, it's because somebody wants to make a million dollars. Well, and it's because it's, it's, there's not a lot of it around. It's artificially bumped up the cost of Yeah, but that's with everything. Everything that's new is, is that way, yes? Okay, so wind power, hydro power, we have to be careful for that though too because what do we have to do to, to tap? Well, and we change water ecosystems. So that one's okay, but I think we should re rely more on things like this. Geothermal energy, heat from what? The heat that the earth's making anyway. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. And basically what he's doing is, is, um, is because it, it's at a constant temperature, yeah, so basically in the winter time, he's, he's heat, exactly. So it saves, you're getting, you're, you're taking, say you're taking pipes 
in your house and you're, you're sending water down through the earth and it's creating a temperature of say whatever 50 50 degrees rather than what it is outside minus 10. That's coming into your house. You warm it up from there rather than warm it up from very, very cold to heat. In the summertime, how is that great? Because you can use that 50 degrees to keep your house cool. You see what I mean? Solar. That to me is the way to go. The, the, again, the question is trying to create technology that can decrease the amount of maintenance it takes right now. The size. And again, if we, if we, if we, um, right. It's not the total answer, but maybe it's a combination of geothermal and solar, or a combination of geothermal wind and solar, right? But why don't we do that? Because power companies want to get rich. No, because it's too expensive. If I say to you right now, the average bear, go build yourself a solar energy efficient home, it's going to cost you three times as much to do that. But so it all comes. The price is high. Well, ag again. <laughs> right. So we supply and demand, right? If we say, okay, we're going to pay an extra few cents for that and everybody does that, what's going to happen to the price of that? It's going to come down. Like my husband got really mad at me because our oil company has biofuel. And right now, what they charge you for biofuel is what? It's five cents more a gallon to buy biofuel than it is to buy the regular oil. Even though in reality, it's probably about 60 cents cheaper to produce it per gallon. But because it's not that common, because it's still clumped in with the whole, Fringe. no, what do they call those? Eco. No, when you, when you have a, a thing that's priced based on, oh, I can't think, no, a commodity. There we go. It's a commodity. It's priced based on everything similar within the commodity group. Yes? Exactly. So my husband said, I'm going to pay five cents. I said, you bet your butt we're going to pay five cents more a gallon because the more of us that do this, it'll bring it down. Plus, I feel better using that. Right? So yeah, I wish, well, we don't, have the, we don't have the system to do that. But So combinations of these guys, solar hydrogen energy, fuel cells. OK, we have, we have that technology. What is fuel? What is the byproduct of a fuel cell? Water. Eh. Okay. Would you rather spew water into the air or carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide? So, and again, it depends. Maybe if we maybe if we put too much water into the atmosphere, then we're going to mess up something on the other side. That's right. So that, that's what the youth of today should look into, these renewable energy resources. They can. Sustainable farming. They can. Oh, they stop you. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Cool. Minerals and renewable, non-renewable resources often mined from the environment like fossil fuels, non-metallic minerals like phosphate, sand, and gravel, and metallic minerals like aluminum, copper, iron, nickel, and precious metals is going to be a problem when we start running out of them. Heavy metals in the environment from overmining, and when we, we looked at that whole little map of the ecosystem and we saw things that normally were trapped underground that we humans are now going and pulling out of the ground are going to end up in our environment. So heavy metals are a threat to human health. Give me an example of a heavy metal. Mercury. Where, where are those coming from? Where are they coming from? The fish, are, the fish are, are paying the price for it. 
But where, yeah, because we take it out, put it into substances that we then do what with? Burn or throw in the trash, gets into our environment, and who suffers? We're suffering as well. But for example, in, in, in a lake environment, do, does anybody have any loons that hang out there? Oh, I love loons. <laughs> well, not for long, because loons like to eat things that fall lower down in your lakes. And what also falls lower down in your lakes? Those heavy metals. So what's happening to a lot of different loon populations, depending on the pop, uh, pollution in different freshwater systems, is be, they're getting heavy metal poisoning because of the, the heavy metals that are in their aquatic environments. Yep. Yep. Right. Because it, it's doing what? Right. Because it's going into your aquatic environment, increasing the lead levels in those um, in those environments. Synthetic organic compounds can be very toxic and inclu influence global climate change. Plastic. It's awesome, isn't it? What's it made from? Oil. <laughs> yeah, fossil fuels, right? How many little tykes kids are there in here? Remember your old cozy coop? It's here forever. How come? Do you know? You guys must know. You must have had a friend or a cozy coop of your own. I know that is. That big plastic car with the big round dome roof, right? You didn't have a cozy coop? I'm sorry. <laughs> they didn't love you. Kind of looks like this with a little bottom. It's like a little car, a little steering wheel. Yeah. Yeah, it's here forever. It's here forever. Because what's it not going to do? It's not going to degrade. So these synthetic organic compounds that we've created are going to be around forever. Exactly. How many? Way too many. Just burn them. Industrial wastes pollute the environment by releasing potentially hazardous compounds like mercury, like lead, into our atmosphere. It goes up into the air and it rains and it comes right back down. Toxic compounds can accumulate then in the food chain. So, no, California is a beautiful place, but we've kind of screwed that up, too. So, the release of raw sewage, and, we, and we're guilty of that in this area, and some of our lake, uh, lake communities contribute to human disease and pollute water sources. So, when we built our house on the lake, and we didn't take the time to make sure that our waste was filtered properly before it went into that water source and we figured that's one big huge lake it's not going to make a difference well it does make a difference so we see um, the effects as they work their way up through the food chain so when algae becomes affected who eats algae these smaller little yeah love those things then the sunfish eat them and then the blue heron eats the sunfish yes so all of the pollutants are going to work their way up through the food chain the more we pollute this the more we're going to see up through the food chain and where we sh where's it showing up in the meat and in the milk that these kids consume. So we look at the size of humans 100 years ago versus today. Has there been a change? Huh? We're much, we're much bigger. We're taller. We're larger. As far as puberty goes, it's happening a lot sooner. Yep. It can, be, it can be several different factors. One of the factors is actually nutrition, believe it or not. 
But then another factor is the hormones, which are increasing those rates because that's what they do in the cow and that's what they do in the chicken. They cause them to grow faster at a faster rate. As you know, none of that stuff is destroyed. It's just recycled. So we recycle it all the way through our ecosystem. So one of the things that we have to hold on to is diversity in our ecosystems, biodiversity. One of the most interesting courses I took at, at, when I was finishing up my master's degree was a course called Biodiversity, talking about how we need to get back to keeping diversity within our ecosystems. The more diversity, the healthier our ecosystems is. The more plants we have in that plot of land in different types, the healthier it's going to be. So we have to stop as humans eliminating the diversity on this planet. And I'm going to pick up Monday with biodiversity. Okay, before we do that, though, I have a